summer, 1939. A golden age of exploration and archaeology is coming to an end. It was an era that saw adventurers set out to explore the remotest corners of the globe in search of clues to unlock our ancient past. And it was during that last summer of peace as the world stood on the precipice of a war that threatened to end civilization itself that three extraordinary treasures were discovered. Treasures that would radically change our understanding of the origins and diversity of human culture. That made this stone the oldest datable artwork ever found in the Americas and bring us closer to our distant past. You scared me! <laughs> in this series, I'll be on the trail of a cast of remarkable archaeologists, each a product of their era, from a self-taught amateur Everybody's pressuring him to get to the treasure. To a pair of charismatic adventurers. We have come upon the hiding place of a unique group of early American heroic sculpture. And an academic driven by a dark political agenda. But here in writing, mm -hmm. he's acknowledging this figure. They're fascinating tales of intuition, eccentricity and luck. I can't believe it. Another lost colossal head. <laughs> each show how archaeology was enlisted into the promotion of very different worldviews. And yet each is a powerful reminder of our shared humanity. To me, it is just an astonishing work of art. In this episode, I'm exploring the discovery of an incredible Anglo-Saxon ship burial in Suffolk, dating from the early 7th century AD the final resting place of a supremely wealthy warrior king. The treasures found in the Sutton Hoo ship have been described officially as the greatest single archaeological discovery in the archaeological annals of England. For a nation on the brink of the Second World War, the hoard revealed an Anglo-Saxon world that would form one of the foundations of British national identity. Described as Britain's Tutankhamun, it transformed our understanding of a mysterious era known by some as the Dark Ages. Yet, the story of the Horde's survival and discovery is something of a miracle. Back in the 1930s, a belief in spiritualism was all the rage amongst the British upper classes. So it's fitting that the modern day story of Sutton Hoo begins with a ghostly vision. A friend of one Mrs. Edith Pretty, staying at Tranmer House in Suffolk, made an astonishing claim a twilight sighting of ancient warriors. Walking on one of the strange large mounds that lay on Mrs. Pretty's estate. Mrs. Edith Pretty was a wealthy widow and a keen spiritualist who believed that the dead could communicate with the living. So rather than dismiss her friend's vision as hokum, she determined instead to have the mounds excavated. And this decision would result in the single greatest archeological discovery ever made in England, the Sutton Hoo Hoard. It was a phenomenal beginning to an unbelievable story. We used to think that when the Romans left in the 5th century, they took civilization with them. And that Britain retreated into a primitive 500-year dark age, during which life here was nasty, brutish and short. But in 1939, the discovery of the Sutton Hoo Hoard changed everything. This exquisite helmet, 
is today perhaps the most iconic artefact to have emerged from the Sutton Hoo burial site. It's known and revered throughout the world for its artistic wizardry, its complex symbolism, and its opulent, sophisticated projection of power. All qualities that were believed to be largely absent during the so-called Dark Ages. Before the Sutton Hoo treasures emerged, we had no idea that pagan, illiterate, early Anglo-Saxon society was capable of such wonders. It took many years of research for high quality replicas like this one to give us a true sense of what the original would have looked like some 1,400 years ago. This remarkable helmet and the hoard it was found within have revolutionized our understanding of the Anglo-Saxon era. and its discovery on the eve of the Second World War was perfect timing. It captured the imagination of the British public as a symbol of the birth of the nation they were about to fight for. Particular Sutton Hoo artefacts played a major role in my decision to become an Anglo-Saxon art historian. But I've always wanted to explore the miraculous story of their original discovery. So I've come to the Sutton Hoo estate, once owned by Mrs. Edith Pretty, where it all began. Occupying high ground overlooking the River Deben in Suffolk, East Anglia, it features around 18 man-made earthen mounds of various sizes. They were known locally as Little Egypt, a fitting nickname for a place that would yield a king's ship burial containing the hoard dubbed Britain's Tutankhamun. To find out more about the enigmatic lady who instigated excavations here in the late 1930s, I'm meeting National Trust expert Laura Howarth. Edith Pretty. We know she was a keen spiritualist, but she was more than that, wasn't she? So much more to her character, I think. She'd been to nearly every continent around the world and seen things that you know most people would have only dreamt of at the time. She had a very keen interest in archaeology from a young age, so she'd been to Pompeii, she'd been to the Valley of the Kings, she'd watched excavations. It really was an age of explorers, wasn't it? So, let's have a go, let's go out and discover things. Yeah. And that's what she was doing here too, wasn't it? It was. Is she a very independent woman? Is she well-educated? What do we know about her? She came from quite a privileged background. She served with the Red Cross during the war over in France, you know, and as a, a privileged woman, she didn't have to do that. She took part in the King's Cup yacht race. God, what a go-getter. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> she yeah. sounds like the sort of person I'd like to spend time yeah. with. She'd bought Tranmer House as a family home in 1926 after marrying Colonel Frank Pretty that same year. The couple kept a household befitting the time, with gardener, gamekeeper, chauffeur and butler. And the curious mounds came with the property. But when the colonel died suddenly in 1934, leaving her alone with their young son Robert, the idea of focusing her previous passion for adventure on the mysterious mounds in her back garden might have been an appealing way to take her mind off her loss. As a wealthy woman of her time and class, in the summer of 1938, Mrs. Pretty simply decided to start digging. But the man she employed couldn't have been more different from her. Basil Brown was a local working class man who'd only traveled the world through the books he voraciously read. Like many men across Britain at this time, Basil worked several jobs to make ends meet. But as a farmer's son, he had a great knowledge of Suffolk soils, and as a self-taught archaeologist, he had a real flair for finding things. 
And it was these skills that Mrs. Pretty was relying on when she hired him. Mrs. Pretty was to pay Basil 30 shillings a week for his services and arranged accommodation on the upstairs floor of her chauffeur's cottage. I am leaving nothing to chance, he wrote as work began, because often the small things count. Most burial mounds in Britain date from before the Anglo-Saxon era to the Bronze Age around 3,000 years ago and have almost always been robbed. But Basil was not the sort to assume anything. And that first summer of 1938, he decided to excavate three of the smaller mounds at Sutton Hoo. Reasoning that smaller mounds would yield quicker answers as to what lay within. OK, so it's that one there, Mound E, um, Mound A, and then Mound D over there. It is quite hard to get your bearings here because originally the mounds would have been a lot taller, so it'd be easier to work out where they all are. Ancient burial mounds were normally made by first digging a deep pit into the ground for the actual burial and grave goods. This was then backfilled before earth and stones were piled high on top to create the surface mound. Digging a trench through each mound, Basil hoped to reach different soil conditions at ground level that could reveal where any burials might be. he soon found evidence of burial pits. But disturbances to the soil all around them made it clear that others had got there first. All had likely been robbed centuries before. Yet there was one crucial clue that proved these mounds in Mrs. Pretty's garden were something far rarer than Bronze Age burials. And we came across a heap of trench snails from a ship. These are usually associated with Scandinavian boats. And when we got down, there was a boat-shaped grave and some rivets were in position in the site. So it showed definitely that there was a boat. Ship burials are incredibly rare in Britain. There are only two others ever discovered at this time. One up at the Isle of Man and another at Snape, which is really near here. So although all the treasure in here was mostly lost and the boat timbers had rotted away, the evidence of a small ship burial at Sutton Hoo was a fascinating development. As Basil predicted, it was the small things that counted. And after the rivets, his meticulous excavation style revealed a little gilt bronze disc, which he was able to identify as an early Anglo-Saxon object. This too was remarkable because nearly every other ship burial known of at this time was Viking. But here at Sutton Hoo, was something much earlier, from that mysterious period in Britain's history, the so-called Dark Ages. It was more than enough to persuade Mrs. Pretty to extend excavations into the following summer of 1939. The question now was whether or not any of the mounds had survived without being robbed. But these were troubled times, lived in the constant shadow of war. And after years of escalating tensions with fascism on the rise, in spring of 1939, Nazi forces seized control of Czechoslovakia. It was a stark warning to the rest of Europe. Most Britons now believed war was all but inevitable. But a warm, dry English summer nevertheless bloomed in Suffolk. And with the countdown to war now on, 
Basil returned to Sutton Hoo to work against the clock, ready to dig Mound One, the largest on the site. The summer of 1939, Basil has been instructed by Mrs Pretty to come back to, to the big mound, but why didn't he start here in the first place? Wisely, he started with smaller ones, mm. so he could understand how they are put together. Mm. He had a good brain on him. He's a man driven by his own curiosity, it seems. Mrs Pretty lent him the gardener and the gamekeeper as his team, and the valiant three then started at the bottom of the mound. After about two days, John Jacobs held up a lump and said, I found a piece of iron. I found the first uh, rivet. I call it rivet. I went to remove it, and he told me to replace it because uh, he said it, uh, it mustn't be removed until there's further investigations. I made a rush and pushed him out of the wise. That was the bow of the um, ship. Basil now knew that iron rivets meant he was looking at a ship and that he needed to excavate around them very carefully to avoid ruining the outline of the long decomposed timbers. He started brushing the tops of the um, rusty ruins with a pastry brush and he had a, a coal shovel on the end of a handle. Oh, long, long, long handle so he could dig something and then chuck it out the side. They trialled the sand, a little bit of red spot appeared. That's where a rivet would be. Then the pastry brush comes out. Then he, he dusts it off and there's one rivet. Yeah. So patient man, mm. he gradually shows the shape of the ship coming out of the sand. Amazing job. Basil quickly realised that this ship was something extraordinary. Here at the British Museum, his diaries capture his sheer excitement. The ship was in a slanted position in the ground, and as Basil kept working away with small tools and his bare hands wherever possible, the ship was widening as it was getting deeper. On Monday, May the 22nd, he writes, the work is getting interesting. I am continuing the slow excavation work of the ship itself, carefully creeping along rivet by rivet. It is now evident, however, that we are up against a far larger thing than anyone suspected. And on Friday, 2nd of June, he declares, certainly now we have beaten the record for ships found in burial mounds in the British Isles. And one might put either Snape or the Isle of Man ships inside this easily. The stakes are clearly getting higher. And by the end of June, with Basil working from 5 a.m. until late every day, thousands of iron rivets revealed a ship the size of which had never been seen before in Britain. 27 metres long and around 5 metres wide. A ship of this size, he mused, must have been that of a king or a person of very great importance. And it is the find of a lifetime. But in a heart-stopping moment, Basil found evidence of medieval grave robbers, a deep pit with broken pottery at the bottom. Could this mean that he was closing in on yet another burial chamber looted of its treasures? So these robbers dug in the centre of the mound, because that's where the juicy bit should be. Right. Uh, but by that time, the end of the mound had been ploughed away, mainly by medieval farmers. So, by sheer luck, when the would-be robbers dug down from what they believed was the central point, they just missed the burial chamber. How much longer had the robbers to have kept digging to have found what was in Mandwell? Well, we can follow Basil. He found a pit, and at the bottom was a gin bottle. That's a, a, well, Bellamine flask. And, they, and that was within a few feet of the chamber. But I love this idea yeah. that if those tread robbers hadn't have stopped for a gin, they might have got the treasures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It was a miraculous twist of fate that had safeguarded the burial chamber right up until the summer of 1939. And the prospect of untouched treasures in a ship of such unprecedented size saw excitement reach fever pitch. Mrs. Pretty often came to watch over the excavations, anxious to discover what the chamber might hold. There's some great insights into Basil the man in his diaries. There's a line here, everyone will have to wait a few days longer before they know what the ship contains. You get a real sense that everybody's pressuring him to get to the treasure, but he needs to progress in a meticulous way. Thank God he did take his time. But before Basil could begin excavating the chamber, a very different personality visited the dig. Charles Phillips was a renowned and well-connected archaeologist from Cambridge University. Well, now, this was, of course, an astonishing site. Nothing like it had ever been seen in England before. And within the hour, the British Museum and the Ministry of Works had been informed. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the powers that be now declared such an important find needed professional leadership. And Charles Phillips was considered the best man in Britain for the job. Loyal and determined as ever, Mrs. Pretty insisted Basil continue as Phillips's right-hand man. Well, of course, that never grasped me because I didn't quite see how anybody was going to take it on. But uh, since no one knew anything about it anyhow, as long as you're a reasonable and sensible person, it seemed to me you might have a bash, you see. So a bash we had. It must have been a blow. But Basil proudly noted how Phillips acknowledged my excavation had been perfect and could not have been better done, and applied some stiff upper lip to the situation. In his final diary entry, before he ceded control, Basil reflected, anyway, I shall not have so much bother and responsibility now in case anything went wrong. I think we shall be able to cooperate all right. At least, I hope so. Charles Phillips now assembled a crack team of young archaeological talent who lodged at the Bull Inn close to the estate. Back on site, he soon found very faint traces of wooden boarding and deduced that the ship had originally held a raised wooden burial chamber. At some point, this had collapsed under the weight of the earth and sand above. As excavations continued, a few small pieces of metal began to appear from the mess. But on July the 21st, everything changed. Quite suddenly, as I was trolling and brushing the sand, one of these lovely garnet and gold ornaments was revealed. Do you see the guy there? And of course, from that moment, we were immensely excited. And I remember Charles Phillips saying, my godfathers. Such rare gems suggested they'd hit the burial place of an Anglo-Saxon warrior king. These extraordinary identical pyramids were the first real treasures to come out of the burial mound at Sutton Hoo. And what an exquisite pair they are. They are made of solid gold. And all over the surface, you could see these finely worked garnets set into gold cells. This is known as cloisonne. Behind each of these garnets, there is a stamped gold foil, absolutely paper thin, almost microscopic. And what this means is that garnet, which is often quite a flat, dull gemstone, actually glimmers and shines. As the light goes through the gem, it bounces off the gold backplate and sparkles back out. This was evidence of a society developed enough to include highly skilled, virtuosic craftspeople. Just look at the way they cut the edge and shoulder garnets as prisms, creating an effect that positively glows. 
That is showing off. That is saying, I know I am the best at what I do and I'm going to display it in my work. But what were these things used for? Well, we don't find out until we turn them over because here at the back, you can see a gold bar and a space behind where a leather strap would have been pulled through. And this would have enabled it to sit on the scabbard of a sword and act like a toggle being moved up and down in order to hold the sword in place. The extraordinary detail that has been lavished on something as incidental as a toggle shows quite how powerful and influential the person that wore this thing must have been. I have to say, I think he also had exceptionally good taste. While the king's body had rotted away, the team were astounded as treasures of unimaginable quality emerged thick and fast. But who were the Anglo-Saxons? And why was this discovery about to change the story of Britain? When Roman Britain collapsed in the early 5th century, pagan Germanic tribes from Northern Europe, known to the Romans as barbarians, began crossing the North Sea and settling in South and Eastern England. In time, these Angles, Saxons and Jutes came together and provided the basis of the English language, even giving us the very name, England. And East Anglia was one of the first regions settled. But until the discoveries at Sutton Hoo, the early Anglo-Saxons had been dismissed as primitive, uncivilized, muddy hut dwellers. These treasures painted an entirely different picture a culture that was wealthy, sophisticated and hierarchical. I personally uh, had the good fortune to be uh, placed where the gold belt buckle came out. Here is what's known as the great gold belt buckle. 14 ounces of solid gold. When it emerged, it looked like this. I can only imagine what it must have felt like for the archaeologists to see this huge hunk of gold glinting out of the ground. It sparkles like the day it was made. To see the gold with this pattern coming out among the sand is an experience that I shall personally never forget. Something like this would have looked hugely impressive from a distance, really emphasising the wealth, the power, the masculinity of the person wearing it. And the decorations themselves provide clues as to how he wielded his power. The Anglo-Saxons believed the wearer took on the strengths of the animals whose images he wore. It gets more exciting and beautiful the closer you get to it because what this really is, is a visual riddle. The Anglo-Saxons loved their riddles, and this was designed to be poured over, to be explored and unpacked. There are 13 birds and beasts that writhe and connect over the surface of this buckle. And there's a real sense of play about finding the eyeballs, isolating the individual creatures. On the shoulders of the buckle, these are hook-beaked birds. You can see the smooth beak picked out there and there's the eyeball and the back of the head. Up here you can see a couple of serpents knotted around themselves. Two more here. The Anglo-Saxons had what we could describe as a horror vacui. They hated blank space, a vacuum. And so the artists tend to fill every bit of their work with detail. It makes it look like the surface is wriggling. It's an imposing masterpiece from what was thought to be a low point in British history. The very same day that the buckle emerged, other finds included a gold and garnet purse frame 
with 37 gold coins, each one from a different region of Francia in modern-day France. They suggested strong continental connections and would later help date the burial to the early 7th century. Everyone, including Basil, were dazzled by what was unfolding before their eyes. I must admit that I never expected to see so much gold in any dig in this country. Needless to say, I did not go home that afternoon. I'm not surprised. He wanted to stick around and see what was happening. And for some, the whole experience was taking on a slightly surreal feel. Whenever you're excavating anything, people think that you must be finding gold. I remember very well coming back to the pub in the evening and having the usual question, well, old boy, you found in gold today? Yes, I said, my pockets are absolutely full. And as I spoke, I was holding the box containing the great gold belt buckle in my rather sweaty hand in my pocket of my coat. And uh, feeling that the best thing to do was to take them uh, at face value. Oh, they said, splendid, you must have a drink. Yes, I said, I need one. Just the next day, on July the 22nd, 1939, the team at Sutton Hoo also unearthed a pair of spectacular shoulder clasps. The clasps revealed a surprising Roman influence on these Anglo-Saxons. This sort of jewellery was very common for hundreds of years across Northern Europe, but this is the finest example of it anywhere. They're supposed to emulate the shoulder clasps worn by generals of the Roman army. They would have been sewn on to a garment and the pin could be pulled out so the garment could be removed. Modern day jewellers struggle to understand how this could be made. But the clasps also help change our understanding of Anglo-Saxon trading networks. These garnets would have been imported from as far afield as modern-day India or Pakistan, and the gold too would have had to have been sourced. What we get here is an indication that England at this period was connected not just with Europe, but with the wider world. Nothing like this has ever been found before, and it really shows how important Sutton Hoo is for understanding the story of England. A press release put out prematurely by Ipswich Museum meant the word was suddenly out. For a nation on the cusp of war, the finds were a proud and patriotic moment. Journalists tried to access the site via boat and aeroplane. But this was still mid-excavation, so two policemen were stationed at the dig 24-7. The system for safekeeping the excavated treasures, however, was a little less formal. Basil's given the honour of carrying some of the treasures up to the house, so you can imagine this procession coming up. Probably the gamekeeper with his shotgun is one of the stories, just for an added layer of protection. Mow him down! Yeah. <laughs> Where would you store the great gold buckle? Well, there is a story about some of the finds being stored under the bed. Obviously. Yes, obviously! Safekeeping. <laughs> so what was the daily reality? for Mrs. Pretty. They were kind of ransacking her house for lots of equipment, finding whatever they could. So bellows, chimney bellows we <laughs> use there, an old Chianti bottle to wash <laughs> some of the finds. You know, it was very much, what can we get our hands on that will help the excavation? There is a, a sort of beautifully prosaic nature to all of this. You know, make do and men, use the bellows. Once things started to, to come out of the ground, mm. she, was, she was there, she was seeing it happen. She was. We've got some lovely photos of her in her Lloyd Loom chair with her friends, you know, observing the dig with some binoculars. She was going to host a sherry party <laughs> as well so that people could come and look at the ship. It's all very of its time. It's an English garden yeah. party. <laughs> <laughs> come and look at my excavation. Maybe the Sutton Hoo discovery was a kind of a moment of hope for people in what would have been quite a bleak, uncertain summer. 
It is that juxtaposition between what's happening in Europe and then this wonderful discovery that's happened, you know, Britain's very own Tutankhamun Valley of the Kings. We were watching the papers every day for news about the war situation, which we felt was imminent. And we all, I know, thought that the moment it began, the, the sky would be black with planes, obliterating what was left of Sutton Hoo and probably us as well. With the threat of war rapidly escalating, work at Sutton Hoo continued even faster. And the remains of a magnificent sword would now begin to reveal more about the mysterious buried man. I've come to meet Dr. Sue Brunning, curator of the Sutton Hoo collections at the British Museum, to explore this sword's significance. Now, Sue, there's this big lump of corroded iron in mm -hmm. front of us. It looks less inspiring than the beautiful gold fittings, but in fact, it's all about the sword, isn't it? Everything that we're admiring in terms of the golden garnet are in the service of the sword. Absolutely right, yes. And the sword was by far and away the most important weapon that a warrior could wield in the early Anglo-Saxon period. If you think about it, a sword is the only weapon that's actually made specifically for killing other human beings, where a spear could be used for hunting or an axe could be related to tools, for example. But a sword is, you know, incontrovertibly a weapon of war. And I think that gave it a very powerful symbolism. There is something here about warrior culture that runs deep through Anglo-Saxon society, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the fact that what we have here is a weapon that is so smartly adorned is telling us that that identity, the identity of the warrior, is something that, that was elaborated, that was kind of made magnificent. During this period, power could be seized by somebody who was able to attract enough strong men, enough warriors to, to their cause. And so if, as long as you could have those people that were supporting you, then you could maintain your power. And they have some rare pieces, don't they? Because the chainmail coat, again, it doesn't look inspiring now. It looks like a hunk of, of metal. But that was really important. Yeah, I mean, it's unique in Anglo-Saxon archaeology. It's the only coat of mail armour that we have to survive from the period. One of the things that I find so fascinating is to imagine the person when they're completely decked out in all of that regalia. Mm. The mail coat, the metal helmet, the belt buckle, the sword harness, the sword itself. You can imagine that person would have looked almost like they were made out of metal, some kind of metal god. And the helmet clearly shows an Anglo-Saxon at the very top of a structured warrior hierarchy. The kind of leader not thought to have existed in this period until revealed by the Sutton Hoo discovery. These objects have their own unique language. If you look at the face, it's quite terrifying. You can see eyebrows, a nose piece, and there's a moustache. But look again, those elements are actually part of a bird. There's the wings, the back, and the tail, and it's flying up the face of the helmet, locking jaws with another creature, a double-headed serpent that runs over the top. The hoard is such a vast find. It's still being studied and revealing new secrets. On the bottom of each eyebrow are rows of garnets. Those on this side are backed with gold foil, but those on this side are not. When it caught the light, this eye sparkles while the other one looks darker. So why do this? It could be because the pagan Germanic god Odin, known by the Anglo-Saxons as Woden, gave up one eye as a sacrifice to achieve knowledge. So maybe the wearer of this helmet was trying to invoke Woden. A final flourish in a terrifyingly impressive set of battle armour. But in a more personal revelation, Dr. Brunning has recently discovered telling wear patterns on this warrior's sword pommel that bring us closer to the man himself. We can see this line of beaded wire is actually worn into a flat strip 
which would mean that they were left-handed. And that's such a personal detail. That is something so intimate that we can learn about this person. This is a little witness of the past, isn't it? It is, exactly, yes. And it's one of the ways in which archaeology, these artefacts, can speak to us, even if at that time they're not leaving us any written records. This lack of written records means we have no description of the Sutton Hoo burial itself. So who was this richly buried warrior? It's divided experts over the decades, but I believe it's Radwald, a man recorded by later historians as a king of East Anglia in the early 7th century. But nobody can say for sure. While I'm always slightly kind of um, uh, ambiguous about wanting to actually name that person, I personally would be quite happy to, to view that person as the king of East Anglia. One of the things that we can't see here is the fact that this person was buried in a 27-metre-long ship. <laughs> exactly. Beneath a gigantic earth mound <laughs> on a high piece of ground. So this is someone who was meant to be remembered. To imagine how these objects might have come together to create a state burial for this early king, the best place to turn is Beowulf, England's oldest surviving work of literature. Deep in the ship, they laid him down, their beloved lord, the giver of rings, the hero by the mast. Great treasures there, far gathered trappings were taken and set. No ship in fame more fittingly furnished with weapons of war and battle armour, with mail coat and sword. There laid to his hand precious things innumerable that would go at his side, voyaging to the distant halls of the flood. The great Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf describes the burial of a Scandinavian king but until the discovery of the hoard, it was believed to be a fantasy epic, with nothing so sophisticated existing on this side of the North Sea. Yet the far-gathered trappings, as described in the poem, now too began to appear at Sutton Hoo. Precious artifacts from across the known world overturning traditional ideas of Britain during this period as an isolated place. The excavation of a large purple dish, initially thought to be a shield, was in fact a huge piece of tarnished Byzantine silver. This dish and others found alongside it had come from modern-day Istanbul. And close by in the chamber, were remnants of textiles that we now know were luxurious cloak fabrics from Syria. Such items reveal a new kind of warrior king, one with a diplomatic side. To bring these goods here, strong alliances must have been forged. A network reaching all over Europe down into the eastern Mediterranean. This European network also brought them into contact with the so-called civilised Christian world. And it was under Anglo-Saxon rulers that these now English kingdoms eventually turned to Christianity. In among all the pagan symbolism was a small hint of things to come. The Sutton Hoo ship burial, by its very nature, is a pagan celebration with everything that the individual would need to feast and fight for all eternity in Valhalla. But the presence of these silver spoons with their tiny crucifixes there makes me think that perhaps, by including these in the burial, he's sort of hedging his bets for the afterlife, keeping all the gods, old and new, happy. Despite some Christian elements, the finds showed an Anglo-Saxon world still overwhelmingly pagan. The hoard is a collection of treasures designed to equip a king for the afterlife, but they also reveal how his great hall, a kind of early royal court, functioned. 
a huge feasting cauldron with an enormous chain. Drinking horns that could hold up to four pints of ale or mead. And musical instruments, all building a vivid picture of the wider culture this king inhabited. The Sutton Hoo Horde illuminated a huge gap in British history, a period in the late 6th and early 7th century where what were previously disparate tribes were now consolidated in seven powerful Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And great halls, like this one outlined in a field in Oxfordshire, once played a key role in this process. Here, feasting took centre stage. It was first discovered by Professor Helena Hamerow of Oxford University. This is an exciting site to be in. Why is it so significant, Helena? Well, we're, we're on the site of an Anglo-Saxon Great Hall, the largest we know to date, and it dates to the age of Sutton Hoo. These flames are sort of showing the outline, aren't they? Yep. But what is the actual scale of the Great Hall here? So this is a little over 30 metres long, nearly 11 metres wide, Huge, it's enormous. You could get a lot of people in here for a party. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. how yes. high is it? Well, of course, we, it, it, it's almost impossible to reconstruct roofs and so on. There's, there's nothing left of the timber. But we do have a really important find from the Sutton Hoo ship burial, in fact, that gives us a really good indication. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the suspension chain that was used to suspend the great bronze cauldron over a fire. And that chain is about three and a half metres long. It would have hung from a cross beam over a fire, so probably the crossbeam would have been maybe five metres above the floor. Yeah. So these are enormous buildings. Sutton Hoo, we have weapons, we have this idea of a warrior elite mm -hmm. with a ruler. Yeah. What would that relationship have been like in a, in a space like the Great Hall? Well, I mean, the, the Great Hall would be where the ruler, where the leader of the war band would, of course, reward his loyal warriors, his followers. And he would reward them really in essentially two ways, by, by offering incredibly lavish hospitality, this feasting on this huge scale, you know, the cauldron full of whatever it was full of, all and you the can drinking eat. horns, all you can eat, <laughs> all you can eat. And also through the giving of gifts, the public giving of gifts in this extraordinary setting. I mean, that's at the very core of this elite Anglo-Saxon society. The original team that excavated Sutton Hoo in 1939. What are your feelings about that excavation and those archaeologists? Well, I mean, they were such pioneers. So of course, they couldn't possibly have known the impact that that discovery would have. But in some ways, I mean, it still shapes the study of Anglo-Saxon archaeology today. And when we think about Great Halls and the life of the Great Hall and elite culture, court culture of that period, you know, we think of the Sutton Hoo ship burial. That's our starting point. But even by late July 1939, with the countdown to war well and truly on, the archaeological pioneers at Sutton Hoo were still having to apply a make-do-and-mend approach. We were rather hard put to know what to do with the packing of the objects. We scrounged boxes and tins and bottles from chemists and grocers. And then, of course, anything delicate had to be wrapped so carefully. We thought of cotton wool, we couldn't find enough. And then we suddenly found a, a huge deposit of lovely cushiony, thick moss, which was perfect for all the packing, and we used it from that moment onwards. Couldn't have been better. They excavated that chamber expeditiously, I think it's fair to say, but with great care and a lot of a lot of talent. I mean, you couldn't have got a better group in many ways. And so they took out 363 finds uh, from the chamber. It took them 10 days, you know. If we did it now, it, it would take us 10 months, I should think, to empty the chamber. Of course. Like I mean, they, had, they were moving fast. They were, and it was kind of heroic, and war was coming, and they weren't really well equipped, but they somehow managed it. As work continued exploring the outer limits of the ship, attention turned to the fate of this extraordinary hoard, 
now being referred to as the Million Pound Grave. Because the finds contained gold and silver, they were subject to the law of treasure trove, essentially an inquest to see if the treasures were deliberately buried with a view to recovering them later on. If so, they would have been the property of the state. But because the Sutton Hoo treasures were part of a ship burial meant to stay in the ground, the jury decided that all of them belonged to the landowner. This was extraordinary. It would have made Mrs Pretty unimaginably rich as they were worth the equivalent of millions and millions of pounds today. But just a few days later, in an extraordinary act of generosity, Mrs Pretty announced her intention to bequeath all of the fines to the nation. She was sent an elegant receipt of goods from the British Museum, listing everything they were now responsible for that had come out of the ground at Sutton Hoo. And another, more personal letter from Basil Brown's wife. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your great kindness in giving my dear husband this work to do. I know how delighted he is, and it is the work he loves. But on the 23rd of August, 1939, just hours after the donation was announced, the British Museum immediately began preparing the finds to go straight back underground. Alerted that war was now imminent, with aerial attacks on London expected any time, the British Museum was urgently evacuating its collections to the disused Aldwych tube station. The Sutton Hoo collection came along this platform and was placed in the tunnel down at the end. This was 10 times deeper than it had previously been buried for 1,300 years, and it wasn't alone. There was a huge array of Roman, Syrian and Greek sculpture, even the Elgin marbles, all huddled together in crates down here to avoid the devastation that was to come above ground. The tunnel was sealed up and a 24-hour guard placed by this door. During the horrors of the Blitz, Londoners too sought shelter on these same platforms. At a time when their own future was incredibly uncertain, they slept just metres away from some of the finest relics of other long-gone civilizations. With the declaration of war on the 3rd of September 1939, preservation was also now the focus at Sutton Hoo for the multi-talented man who'd started it all. Basil Brown was involved right up to the very end, with his final gestures taking on a rather symbolic quality. So he helps cover the ship with bracken from the wood and hessian. But his other kind of last act is that he helps Mrs. Pretty's chauffeur build an air raid shelter here on site. He wanted to help not only protect the ship, but also the people that lived here on site during the war. I find that really moving, actually, mm. to protect his legacy there, but also to protect her and her son. In fact, had they not excavated when they did, there might have been no legacy to protect at all. Having lain undisturbed through 1,300 years of history, dodging medieval grave robbers, the treasures were saved just in the nick of time. With the country now at war, the Sutton Hoo burial mounds were briefly called into service as a tank training ground. So the horde narrowly missed obliteration under the weight of 20-ton tanks. It was another unbelievable moment in the miraculous story of the horde's survival.
As for Mrs. Edith Pretty, in 1940, Prime Minister Winston Churchill wrote offering a CBE for her tremendous donation of the Sutton Hoo treasures, an honor she mysteriously declined. She actually turns down Churchill during the war. That gives you a real sense of what sort of a woman she was, I think. Perhaps she'd simply had enough of the spotlight, but Edith Pretty's story had one last tragic twist. It's a real shame because Edith passes away in 1942, so these treasures have been buried underground for 1,300 years. They briefly resurface, and she never gets to see them put on display. There is something very sad about the fact that she's given this gift to the nation, and what she would have loved to have seen is how celebrated it is today, I'm sure. She would, yes. I think she would be really proud and pleased. And, you know, the story isn't over. You know, the 1939 was just the beginning of the discovery. When war in Europe finally ended in May 1945 and the treasures were retrieved from Aldwych Station, experts then faced a huge challenge, piecing together the many fragmented parts of the hoard. The interest was attached, first of all, to the shield, which had a very obvious and very interesting shield boss. We had to find the shape, which we discovered was circular. And thanks to the fact that the periphera was ornamented with a dozen dragons, uh, we were able to get some idea of the size. And you can imagine how very interesting it was for the technical men, my colleagues in the laboratory, it was a decades-long process, and to this day, we're still unravelling the meaning of these remarkable discoveries. But what is beyond all doubt is that the Sutton Hoo Hoard, one of the richest burials ever found in Northern Europe, captures a critical moment not just in the story of England, but of Britain and the early 7th century world. It offers a unique window into a time when mighty Anglo-Saxon kings were building their kingdoms, an era that culminated just a few centuries later in the emergence of something resembling a nation. It still amazes me that the Sutton Hoo ship burial was discovered at all because there was just so much luck to the process. The idea that the chamber had never been robbed, and that on the eve of the most destructive war the world has known, Basil Brown and his team of excavators here broke through the earth and brought to light this set of golden, glorious objects that would transform our understanding of the early medieval period. No longer seen as a dark age where life was nasty, brutish, short. This showed a world connected with Europe, with strong diplomatic links, and a ruler who wasn't just a military hero, but was able to control a kingdom. This was page one of England's history. And everything that would come to define England, its language, its geography, its identity, that all began here at Sutton Hoo. As excavations in your back garden go, it had proved rather successful.